Hello, romantics. I'm Sarah Gomez, author, romance lover, and host. You're listening to Romancing the Story, a podcast centered around writing, reading, and story structure, all with a twist of romance. We're at episode 29, and on today's episode, I talk with Poppy Darling about adoring romance so much that she started a podcast about it, something I might know a little bit about. We discuss how romance can empower and give freedom to explore in safe spaces. I noticed while editing this episode, I mentioned the female gaze quite a bit in reference to romance. Just to clarify, while there is quite a bit of romance that's female geared, romance is an ever evolving genre. Part of the reason I love it. There are many male romance readers and writers out there many who are utilizing their gaze to inform and expand the romance genre. There is also more and more non-binary representation within the romance category, featuring and representing that point of view. If you find a book that piques your curiosity, desire, interest, and is a book you identify with, then it was meant for you. Romance isn't a one-size-fits-all. If a romance book has a main character's desires highlighted in a way that resonate with you, read and enjoy it to the fullest. One other thing I noticed. We delved so deep into our topic that I forgot to introduce Poppy, so I'll insert it here. Welcome, host of Confessions of a Closet Romantic, Poppy Darling! Yay! Okay, now let's jump right into the discussion. So yes, my sister was a sailor in the Navy. So like cussing really doesn't bother me, but I know people when they hear my voice or they see me, they mm-hmm. think I'm really soft, as oh. I've been told. So uh, I get I get the comments of like, oh, if someone cusses in front of me, they always look at me and say like, oh, I'm so sorry. And I'm like, why are you, why are you, I don't be offended. I'm not. <laughs> There's something, in my opinion, there's something more than a little sexist about hearing women's voices and seeing how they present themselves and assuming certain things. And I have definitely found this with my cute candy colored podcast logo and Mm. with my new recent online dating experiences. Because if I tell people I'm a podcaster and I say I'm a romance podcaster because part of my journey has been embracing that and not being afraid to say it. I I don't always get there, but I judge my company. And then I say, you know what, screw it. I'm going to say, I'm a romance podcaster. Go ahead, make assumptions all you want. Talk to me for a little while and you're going to be surprised because I'm not talking cotton candy Hallmark movies. Nothing wrong with those. But that's not all there is to me. And I refuse to be put inside a box like that because of the assumptions people make about my gender or my interests. And this is really, for me, something that has always bothered me about the romance genre. And it was the reason I started my podcast. See, and that's so interesting to me because, you know, I feel like when I know a lot of people and I've interviewed several authors on my podcast, like when you say romance writer, or when you say like, I, I'm a romance podcaster or anything really that's in the romance genre specifically, people have a certain thing in their mind. Like they like, yeah, they put you in a box Mm -hmm. and, and because of that, I know several authors. and, And like I said, I've interviewed several authors who go under pen names simply for that reason, because they're like, I don't want this kind of leaking into my personal life, or I don't want this kind of people associating these things necessarily with me, even though I don't, you know, I write them and I enjoy them, but it's just, you know, there's a, I think there's a deviance that's associated with it and how, you know, and that's, I think that's why I started my podcast was kind of to dispel that myth and say, like, there are so many great things about romance we can take from. Uh, yeah. as writers uh, just across the board and from other genres. Mm-hmm. So like, mm-hmm. is that why you started your romance? Oh, I, you, you are preaching to the choir, honey, because <laughs> that is precisely why I started my podcast. Um, I, I One thing that really was sort of the genesis of it all was I 
was it was early days of the pandemic and I started um I had wanted to start a podcast for years I'm not exaggerating for years and I could never hit on the topic that I thought I could talk about uh, for an extended length of time. And I realized during the pandemic, I started watching Outlander. I'm sure your listeners are well aware of the <laughs> yeah. romantic power of the Outlander. Okay, so I watched, I gobbled that series up. Like I was really mildly obsessed. I did a whole episode about my obsession about mm. this. And I even delved into why am I so obsessed over this one show? And I realized This is something I have not just been interested in, but it is a genre that speaks to me, something about my deepest desires and what I feel I offer to the world. So when I read these stories, I feel like I'm home, that they reflect how I how I value things in the world and how I want to show up in the world. And then right on the heels of that, oh, maybe I could do a romance podcast right on the heels of that was a wave of shame. And this wave of shame, I would say has been with me pretty much from my teen years when I took my grandma's Harlequin romances and sat on the curb on a summer night with my best friend under the streetlight. And we would read the racist. And as we know, uh, category fiction isn't always super spicy, but for us as 16 year olds who are yearning for love and connection, we would read these spicy sections to ourselves or to each other. I mean, and there was something so powerful about claiming that as a teenager. And I was raised a devout Catholic in, in a very devout household. And so, and my friend was too. And so there was something a little subversive about it. Like, well, we have these desires. I mean, but what do we do with them? And so for me, the romance genre was the place where that was accepted. It was celebrated. It was talked about. Um, it was talked about in the most beautiful terms. Mm. And I just wanted more. And I could not equate the feelings I had about the genre and my own feelings inside about my own desires and this outside shaming of it. It was like, why are we shame? What is so shameful about that? So, Sarah, did you ever feel that when your connection with the romance genre? I did. And in fact, that's a very similar kind of path that I took. You know, it actually, I'd been thinking about the podcast for years Mm -hmm. and then it was the beginning of the pandemic. Cause I was like, why not at this point? Mm -hmm. Uh, But romance as, as a whole, I I grew up very religious as well. I grew up Mm -hmm. in a very religious household as well. And I did discover kind of, and my first entrance into it was actually romance. Um, sorry, Christian romance. (laughs) Oh, right. Right. So I found those and I was like, I really wanted something a little more out of it. I loved the fact that the woman's desires were kind of put in the spotlight because Mm -hmm. I think very few media does that, especially back, you know, then what mid 2000s, late 2000s, like it, it, there was very few things geared towards um, women's desires as far as like expressiveness That's and right. um, out, especially out in the, you know, public consciousness. Mm-hmm. So that's when I started discovering, like I went to my local borders, rest in peace. <laughs> oh, I know. What a sad thing that was to say goodbye to borders. Yeah, yeah. I know. Cause it was the only place in my small oh. town that had mm-hmm. like, um, books, uh, like romance books. And I would kind of peruse the romance book section and I felt, Ooh, I felt like, like I was doing oh. something terrible. <laughs> I know it was like, it was like naughty, but then it, I started thinking to myself, why is this so naughty? Like it was right. always a kind of combined thought. Why? Cause I, I guess I, I tend to be, I'm the second born. I tend to be a little, um, I don't know, um, oppositional sometimes <laughs> to authority <laughs> and things like that. And it was like, well, well, why is this such a bad thing? But I, but I would not read them in public. I don't know if you were like that too, but you know, because a lot of the covers they have, they have changed over the years. But in the days when I started reading romance, a lot of the covers were Fabio and naked male torsos, which I am a okay with, by the way, listeners. <laughs> <laughs> but it was like I don't know if I want to read this on the subway, and and then you know, it was like why not? Why not? 
you know? So it was like, a, it was a struggle. And I have to say, I don't know, Sarah, if you've read this book, but there's a book called Dangerous Books for Girls by a romance author, Maya Rodale. Have you read this, Sarah? I've heard of it. Okay. I have heard of it. This is, I highly recommend this book for anyone who has ever felt ashamed of their love of the romance genre, because she goes uh, goes back throughout history and she takes a look at this genre, which has always been super popular, not only for women, but mostly for women. And it has always been highly lucrative and that would be lucrative for men, right? Because mm. they were in the main, they were the businessmen. And she talks about why something so popular and so lucrative would have ended up so reviled for so long, even to this day. And she goes all the way back into the mid nineteen, mid early nineteenth century, and looking at this. So it's it was a, a book that really gave me support to start my romance podcast because I thought I am, and you are, and anyone who reads this genre supports um, an open exploration a positive sex age body positive exploration of women's desires it is almost um it's almost a subversive act i think sometimes to seek out stories like this and i feel happy every time i can feature stories on my podcast that feature women getting their desires met Exactly. And I think that's why it's so dangerous, maybe, to men in particular, is because romance does centralize the woman and her desires as kind of the main, right, the, the main yeah. want, the main desire, the main yeah. peak of what of what she's going after. And she's not afraid to go after it and have um, the man basically not submit, but kind of were, you know, be that desirable char character for her, for her to, to suit her desires, to suit yeah. her wants and needs. Yes. I mean, this is why female gaze anything like um, your recent film, or when you think about there's female gaze porn and there's female mm. gaze stories and movies. And this is why it's so important in art to have multiple voices of all types, you know, because we are not used to being central to a story. Mm -hmm. It happens, but it doesn't happen that often. And I think we get used to um, heterosexual males being the, um, the protagonist, the person who acts in the movie and the person who gets their desires met. And we are so used to that, that when you read a romance story and the woman's desires and needs are being paid attention to, it can feel shocking in some ways because it's just not something most people encounter. Well, and, and it's so interesting that you mentioned too, because the romance genre is the most, by far the most popular right? Yeah. That sells the yes. most. I think it's like close to, I, I looked at the numbers a couple of episodes ago and I think it was close to a billion dollars yeah. industry. It's in the billions for yeah. sure. So it's, it, to me, it's, it's kind of baffling and really mm -hmm. sad that it's one of those things that's kind of uh, reviled and, or, you know, mocked, really mocked yes. is what the word I was looking for. It's really mocked more than anything. Mm -hmm. um, as far as that genre, just because I feel like it is, like you said, the female gaze, because mm -hmm. that was something we actually talked about at one point, And we would like to work into our short films is we're doing something very horror centric because again, very male dominated. So we yes. were like, why not females? And I'm actually working it into one of the scripts that Love at it. one point a lady gets, because I've experienced this many times and I've talked to many EMTs about this and they feel the same way mm. um, that when a woman, uh, one of my characters gets blood on her pants, well, she tells a cop it's menstrual blood. And he immediately oh. freaks out because oh. I found that actually happens quite a bit. Like I've known some EMTs who kind of like rear back at like that idea of menstrual blood. And I'm like, uh, why? It's the most natural thing in the world. And yet you're freaked out by it. <laughs> that is very interesting. And also, I don't know about you, but I have actually had men in my life 
surprised that we can be surprised by when a period starts. It's like, you know what? It's not on a timetable. We don't get an alarm that goes off at 1 p.m. on a Friday saying, by the way, here's here it comes. Like, you know, th this sort of thing will happen from time to time. And holy cow, like, you're not okay with that? You don't understand? <laughs> like, what would that be about? What a what an amazing thing to include in a horror film that is brilliant. <laughs> yeah, that's what we thought too. We were thinking, like I said, we're we're trying to take these like very feminine things and saying, like, why are they so scary to basically yeah. everyone else? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. And I'm sure the theories abound. You could probably write a thesis paper on all of the different angles on why is that so scary. Exactly. Exactly. So we, we really wanted to take that and, and use that as an elevation. And especially, I think we are seeing a Renaissance. Maybe it's just in my head that because I run a romance <laughs> podcast now, but I see like a Renaissance of like people using the female gaze more and more. Mm -hmm. And really like that's coming into the forefront. And like you said, because you wanted to start this podcast and spotlight how yeah. great these romances really are and what we can learn from them, what we can learn about ourselves and other people. And especially, yeah. like I said, our own desires. I think that's oh. super important. Yeah. And I also like, think, I don't know if you feel this way when you are creating art that is female centric, but there is a power in speaking out loud that I did not realize until I started my podcast. Do you find that too? I do. I do. Yeah. Like there is a certain, there is a power of speaking it out loud and saying, you know, uh, those words or saying, you know, like romance is great. Romance is yeah. fun. Oh, I do yeah. have that. I will say, I do have a story that I thought of you because I was like, I feel like Poppy would appreciate this <laughs> is, um, I knew a girl in, uh, she was an acquaintance in college and super sweet, adored her. Mm -hmm. Uh, her name is Becca. Becca wouldn't mind me calling her out. Sorry, oh, Becca. Yeah. But she read on her Kindle all the time. Like we had like basically all the same classes together because we were doing the same major. Mm -hmm. And she would be on her Kindle like between classes, uh, just waiting, you know, even when we would finish our work early and we were just waiting there, she would be reading on her Kindle just constantly. And I kept asking, I asked her once, what are you reading? <laughs> oh, she looked at me dead in the eye and just said the dirtiest romance. And oh. I was like, oh, Okay. And I was just like, you go girl. But I said, uh, I said, you, you read that in class. And she's like, oh yeah. She's like, in fact, the, basically the naughtier, the better. She said, Ooh. because I love the fact that nobody knows what I'm reading. Cause she was on yes. a campus. She's like, she's like, I'm reading the, you know, the most raunchiest scene and like, mm -hmm. it's hot and heavy. And she says, and nobody knows, nobody knows no. the difference. Well, let me just say, because I have had an evolution of a sorts in my own life because of doing my podcast, there is something a little bit kinky about that. And it's beautiful. <laughs> I love it. Oh like my God. That, that is the mildest kink. But when you think about the power, look at that woman. She is saying, this gets me going. This particular setup gets me going. And it didn't bother her to say out loud, this is why. And I think when women do that with each other and for each other, it empowers it empowers more than a few people. I think it empowers us to go, at least in my experience, to then go and be more open with others about our own desires and their desires and be accepting of them. Like just the fact that she could just say that just to you straight up. I mean, it's not something I encounter very often in life unless I bring it up, but oh, let me tell you, I bring it up at every opportunity now. <laughs> and you know what? I often say, I don't know about you, but I often say, who am I? Mm -hmm. Okay, that is how different I am now because of romance, just in two short years of doing my podcast. I could see that. Yeah, there is a certain, I think, confidence it breeds mm -hmm. and kind of a certain, you know, possession of your own faculties like of, of yourself as a as a woman as a yeah. you know as a person as your desires because that was what got me for her she had no qualms mm -hmm. Becca had no qualms about talking about it and then yeah. she would say you know 
she was she because she said it just out loud without yeah. any hesitation whatsoever it yeah. made me think wow what kind of like person are you that you would have like such a great possession of your own desires or your own wants and have no shame whatsoever because we were like yeah. 19 i was yeah. still like kind of slowly edging out of you yeah. know that religious very religious mm, very strict mm. mindset um mm. before i you know really had my wild years oh. that might have started it i don't know <laughs> no def- i mean definitely we i think being a late bloomer is perfectly acceptable when you have um had the strongest i mean i think organized religion is one of the strongest conditioning um that you can have and to give yourself time, but I believe that the romance genre helps you, at least it has in my life, it's helped me explore very mm. safely and privately until I got to the point where, uh, you know, in the beginning of my podcast, it was a lot about costume dramas, which is fine, Jane mm-hmm. Austen, and then pretty soon, fast forward, I'm doing a whole episode on kink and romance, okay? This is the this is the journey I've been on, and this is because of the bravery and the skill of romance writers, because you have to be pretty brave to say, this is a trope I love, you know, like, enemies to lovers and I'm going to really explore Mm -hmm. that and I'm going to explore a dynamic that in the bedroom can seem a little threatening sometimes maybe even triggering but I'm going to love on these characters and I'm going to take this to the limit and I'm going to explore these ideas contained in this trope container well that is something that is so useful for someone like me who did not, I was a very, I'll tell you, Sarah, I, I had my first serious boyfriend when I was 19. I dated a little, but I was like a hundred percent nerd and I was pretty sheltered in a sense. And so I didn't start exploring those things till later. And so here I am at this age, I'm doing a romance podcast. And I'm thinking, wow, the heart is just so elastic. As long as you stay open to what's inside that you can really explore through art some very, maybe what used to be threatening um, experiences and emotions, but you can do it safely and privately and then just mull over, gosh, what do I think about that story for myself? Like, can I picture myself in that situation? And did this feel titillating? And if it did, great, let's go forward and look up more of this stuff, you know? Exactly. And that's how I feel a lot about it too. It it does create a safe place, right? For us to kind of find who we are or what we like, because there have been like some of these pioneers of these romance writers out here writing like monster romance. And I'm like, I didn't even know I liked that. And I was just like, wow. (laughs) Y'all really, y'all really out here changing my mind about things. And I love it. I'm not mad. (laughs) Right. I cannot be mad because it's just, it, it is as individual as the writer's imagination mm-hmm. and the idea that, you know, you would think, oh, well, you know, what's new under the sun about sex, you know, but it's amazing how love, sex and connection can be l- turned over and looked at in such a unique way by every single one of these authors. And I don't know about you, but I feel like my to be read pile is just stuffed. And every time somebody says, have you heard of, and they'll name a title or an offer, and I'll think there's more. It feels mm-hmm. like know, infinity right? out there in terms of romance. There are so many great writers and tropes and plots and stories. It is for me a genre that never gets old because who isn't concerned about love and connection as a human being? There isn't one person who isn't interested in that topic, you know? Exactly. And I say, I've kind of said it on several of like my bios and everything like that. And in a couple of episodes, but I think every story is a love story because yes. that's what it comes down to, whether it's romantic love or mm-hmm. even relationship love of some sort, it comes down to, we want the love and the connection there. Oh, it, it's, it's a dry, it's on that peri- pyramid of needs. It's a, it's a driving force. We all, you know, food, water, shelter, and connection. We we began as a species, you know, in tribes and groups. And it was that was the power and protection of it. And I don't think that ever um goes away in anyone's life, you know, whether or not they can attain 
oh, I don't know, there's platonic love and there's friend love and there's romantic love. And hopefully people can be open to all kinds of love. And that's what I try to promote on my podcast. But there is something obviously super special about romantic love and Mm -hmm. nothing wrong with wanting it and not finding it. Nothing wrong with wanting it and going to look for it. Nothing wrong with having it and then holding it for many, many years or any permutation of the above, any. That's what this podcast has taught me, that you can structure your search for connection in any way that feels right for you and the other consenting adult that is involved or consenting adults who are involved with you. And that's, I think, what I, what I've taken away from it too, from like running the podcast and talking to so many great and diverse authors who write different genres or different types of romance, mm-hmm. is that there's a lot of room to play in mm-hmm. the this kind of genre, and like, and there's nothing wrong if your love story or you want a love story that may look non traditional. Absolutely. You know Absolutely. This is where I am at currently in my own life. And I do attribute and give all of the credit to my podcast and interviewing people and reading lots of different stories. And of course, our current American culture where Mm. luckily um, relationship and love, there's a gender and sexual identity. It's all more fluid now. And that gives me personally an enormous sense of freedom to define what romance and love and connection and sex mean to me personally. And most importantly, to be able to identify that and say that to other people, hey, this is what I'm looking for. Is this something like you're looking for? And then we can just agree that, yeah, we think we might be on the same page. Let's get to know each other. You know, that is something I did not grow up with. And I find it incredibly liberating. Well, and I feel like that's why romance fans in particular are kind of the most passionate, right? Of almost any other genre and or um, book fans is because Mm -hmm. we, we know what it feels like to kind of be on the other end of kind Mm -hmm. of that shame or kind of closeted, like you've mentioned, uh, like your podcast is titled (laughs) closeted romantic, where you don't say those things out loud. You don't talk about it and, you know, mixed company, anything like that. So like we kind of bond all together, like, oh, you like romance too? So do I. (laughs) Well, and also I do love that you can say, um, you know, most people who read the genre, write the genre and appreciate it will avoid yucking others yums you know Mm -hmm. there are some tropes that trigger something for me they may not for you but I am going to support you if monster mm -mm, we won't say if monster mm -mm books are your thing go on with your bad self enjoy Mm -hmm. yourself I said in one of my episodes there's no romance police like just be free to get recommendations you can say Hey, I read this book where um, two people had sex and they kind of thought they hated each other. And at first I thought that was not a good thing, but I kind of got into it. I kind of found that <laughs> hot, like, nice. what, you know, and it's like, okay, um, what other stories can I read that have that dynamic? Okay. Yay. You know, when someone does that, I'm like, yes, you found your thing. Good for you. We all are turned on the different things, Mm -hmm. but that's why the genre is so amazing because um, it can shock you uh, what actually gets you going. And I love when people say, now I want to explore that further. Oh, love it. I agree a hundred percent with with that, because one thing I found is that the romance, romance tends to like lean into some of those tropes. Mm -hmm. Like, especially when, like you said, like the, that, the subset of like the monster romance, like some people, I think when it first started to become popular, people kind of reared back and was like, Whoa, this is a little too far. But then you saw a lot of writers really lean into it and kind of make it a bigger category and say like, there's nothing wrong with this. You know, right. Right. more popularized to where it's it's not a bad thing no no because I mean I think as romance lovers if we are truly romance lovers equal opportunity romance lovers we need to accept that there are different types of people 
who have different desires and they are entitled to them. And hey, if being penetrated by tentacles is your thing, which PS, it's not my thing, but I'm not, listen, I'm not going to king shame. Okay. If that is your thing, go for it. There is something beautiful about saying this is harmless if I just live in this um, make-believe world for a while and feel excited and completed and feel seen, whatever it is that you feel, there is nothing wrong with that. And so I just always love when people kind of you know, my podcast is called Confessions of a Closet Romantic, okay? When people confess to me in a kind of low voice, like, I kind of love this monster book where the shape-shifting werewolf does her really violently. And I'm like, hey, I get excited for you because (laughs) it's just so, this is not, oh, they met and they got on the relationship escalator and they went to going steady and then they got engaged. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but it's not everyone's cup of tea. And sometimes they don't realize it's not their cup of tea until they read something else, an alternative, and then say, wow, like I read a book. I talk about it a lot because it blew my mind. It was so well done. It was a book about a threesome and it was a book about two gay men in a committed relationship who were looking for a third and they specifically wanted a woman. And this is something that I had never really, I mean, I knew about threesomes, but I didn't know the dynamics. I, I never explored that. And I read this book and I could not believe how much I loved these three together. Like it was just the most beautiful story of connection, caring, cherishing, love. And that's not always what people think of when they think threesome. I think they Mm -hmm. think giggly, um, hot anonymous sex, uh, hotel sex, or the way that they're picturing that is not how this book presented it. And I loved that. I loved learning that there are lots of different ways to do lots of different things in the romance world, in the world of love and connection. And I appreciate that author for introducing me to those ideas. Loved it. Oh, I do too. And I love when romance authors really show a dynamicism, like a, a dynamic between like uh, characters and between like like I said, the women's desires, because sometimes, you know, we're, we're more than just one type of person. I think people try to fit people in boxes. That's it. Exactly. And they try to say like, well, you're obviously like, Sarah, you have such a high voice. You have such a sweet voice. You look so soft. You don't obviously don't like cussing. And I'm like, motherfucker, I can cuss if I want to. (laughs) Don't you fucking come for me. But like, like I can do whatever I, you know, like Uh I I don't mind. I don't cuss all the time, but I don't Mm -hmm. mind it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but you want to put me in a box. And I think that's what we do with a lot of women in particular, you know, obviously she's a mom. So she's very straight laced and she's the drives a minivan and Mm -hmm. she just stays home and, you know, stuff like that. We, we have these assumptions we make, Yes, but I love, and I love when romance writers particularly, because I'll call out the book you told me about the, a lady of Rook's grave manor. Oh, oh, so good. (laughs) So good. Highly recommend if like, if you're in the monster genre, subgenre, please check it out. Or even if you want your mind changed a little bit. I would recommend. And she goes as one, she grows as a character and we go on that journey with her. And I think that's a really powerful thing that romance has a tendency to do. Take a character in one stage and have them grow into this love and into being loved by somebody else or or several somebody else's. Several hot somebody, not Mm -hmm. even somebody's, but uh, monster-ish types. Uh, Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. But what I love best about that book too Mm -hmm. is especially in the hands of good writers, you know, you get a lot of interior monologue about their struggles in the beginning, especially. And while, while they're sleeping with someone, while they're trying to figure out what, you know, their desires are and what they want. I love it. And I loved how that book started with um, a woman of her era and um, her position. So she started Mm -hmm. out as a housemaid, right? It was a Mm -hmm. house. I believe that was her position. Um, feeling her desires, feeling like she had a high libido and how men in that era, at least in the book, this is how it's presented. Men in the era 
treating her like a slut because she mm-hmm. had very strong sexual desires and was not shy about that either. And that she was open to, let's say, offers or overtures. And I, when I was reading that, I thought, that's ridiculous that this young woman was shamed for that and that she was put into a category where she was an outcast, basically. Oh, I can't even remember her name, but, you know, be like, oh, Sally, that slut downstairs who will just spread her legs for anybody. And it's like, Mm -hmm. no, she actually, yeah, she had a high libido, but she was not not choosy. She was just always looking for someone who appealed to her and she would be willing to enter into connection with them. And there is nothing wrong with that. And I think a lot of it, when you read these stories, it's your internalized sexism um, and some other things that society puts on you as a woman that makes you think, oh, is that okay that she's like that? I mean, when I was first reading about her, I was like, oh, this girl can get down with like anyone who comes along. And I was like, no, that's my internalized sexism. There's nothing. This is how men have been for many generations. There's nothing wrong with that. So it really does enlarge my worldview when I read romance. And I think that's something very surprising that I think a lot of people just would not assume. Well, and I kind of read into it a little bit of the character in particular, the heroine is mm-hmm. being conditioned almost to a certain mm-hmm. degree to think of herself that way. Is oh, that yeah. just I because of the way men treated her mm-hmm. because it was slut shaming. It's just like, well, she couldn't, you know, she's a deviant. She can't, you know, she can't right. control her own desires. And right. but when she got to a place where that, you know, being that way to where she was very passionate, then Mm -hmm. that was kind of exalted. That was really, you know, very put on a pedestal and the men wanted to love her. So she in turn wanted to love herself and wanted more out of it than just a quick, a quickie, basically. Yes. Good point. Because it's almost like a story about needing to find your people. Mm -hmm. Like, let's say you're into kink. Well, there's a whole lifestyle and community for people who think that way. And there, and let me just say too, there's a, there's such a wide spectrum. It's not just 50 shades of gray BDSM. Mm -hmm. I'm sure a lot of listeners know that, but there's a wide spectrum. It's, it all can come under the umbrella of non heteronormative and that's okay. It's like, you know, heteronormative is a big group over here, but they might not be your people. And I feel like the heroine in that story she got to that house and she was like, oh, I can finally be myself with no judgment. I have found my people. I have found partners who seek me out for what I offer Mm -hmm. and do not judge me, who honor it and don't disrespect me. I mean, they were very respectful. I mean, if Mm. I remember right, they were, you know, getting appointments with her. It was like the experience of being with her was starting to be such a sort of lauded thing that they wanted time with her. And it, that is, uh, it does my heart good when I read stories like that, because it says there's nothing wrong with you, even if society does treat you and your desires as deviant or outside the norm, celebrate that. There's nothing wrong with that. You just have to find your people. Yeah. And the the thing that I loved most about that book, and I think of romance as a whole, like majority of will give the woman the power. Yeah. And that's where that, where, where that relationship lied. The power was squarely in the woman's hands of what, yes. what she could do and what, yeah. And who she could be with. Oh, and, and I think the character does say, you know, she stands in for us reading this and we're like, mm-hmm. oh, what would that be like? I have to say, Sarah, when I um, went to the house with this character and she was put up in this beautiful room and she was allowed to pick and choose the people she would, the, or the creature she would partner with. I said to myself, okay, that's a kink I didn't know I had. But you right? know what? There's something really appealing about that. And yes, part of it is, but of course, we should always feel the power of our desires articulated and 
be respected for those. Mm -hmm. Like we, we always had control over that. We haven't always felt like we have had, and there have been a lot of socioeconomic reasons why women have had to make other choices other than based on what do I want? What are my desires? Can I articulate them? And then say them very directly to people. There have always been challenges to being able to do that. But the beauty of the romance genre is that you can live through characters' lives, characters who are doing that and getting those desires met. That's the most wonderful and powerful part for me. (laughs) Well, and I love that you bring that up because a lot of times what we crave in like showing those power dynamics in a romance book varies. Mm -hmm. And just like you said, there's a variety of spice levels, of subgenres, of just types of books. Like I will fully admit, I am all for like the boss trope, like the boss Ooh. and kind of like you can find me all day for that. Oh my yeah. gosh. Oh yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. So like, I'm sorry, I just can't help myself. But oh. it's amazing. But I will read that all day long. And I know, you know, that's a power, there is a power dynamic there, but I enjoy yeah. that. And that's a well, safe place for me to explore. That, that's such a good point. Oh, by the way, I have a recommendation for you. I don't know if you've read mm. By a Thread by Lucy Score. Ooh, okay, no. this, this is the ultimate, for me, this is the ultimate boss employee romance. <gasps> um, but I, so I just interviewed Isabel Pop of bookriot.com. She had done an essay recently that was something like, um, should romance novels reflect realities or indulge fantasies? And it was a wonderful, I highly recommend people look up this uh, essay she did. And it made, so she brought up the fact that millionaire romances, she has a hard time suspending her disbelief because she doesn't personally believe there should be millionaires on this planet. Mm. But that sometimes it's okay to bypass that discomfort. Like, say workplace romances, sometimes the power dynamic is not in favor of the woman. And there can be some uncomfortable things about that, some Mm -hmm. sort of inappropriate things. But the point that Isabel was making is that it's okay to indulge a fantasy in a book. It is just a story. Mm -hmm. It's okay to, it's okay to say, oh, I would love to have my boss take me over the top of my desk. But it obviously, if that ever happened in real life workplace, I would be, you know, that would be 100% horrified, obviously. (laughs) Um, But to just live through the dynamics of that, the spiciness of a man who just cannot wait to be intimate with you, there is something really wonderful about living in that moment for just a little bit so yeah I think we have to just remember there's no romance police just go for it read these stories and say yeah that might be a little inappropriate in life but in a story wow was that ever hot and sexy to read oh 100 percent. and I will say this I do I, I love that because romance is like the most popular like genre out mm-hmm. there that we we have a tendency to kind of change the uh, the discourse out there. Yeah. Because yeah. one thing I will say is if you always, if you're a little on the fence on reading certain romances, mm-hmm. not everyone yet, but writers are starting, romance writers in particular are starting to take their book blurbs and put in like content warnings. Yes. That's something I actually talked to with my book blur- blurb expert in one of my other episodes. Mm. And she was saying romance is really taking the forefront of that. And yes. they're changing, like uh, they're putting content warnings. And how mm-hmm. how great is the romance genre and that we would I, do that? We go the extra mile for other people. Well, and it's, I feel like it's like women taking care of women. Mm-hmm. And 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 let me just say, uh, there are there are male romance writers and readers. So I try to be inclusive in my language. I always start by saying Mm, hi, romance friends, because whoever you are, if you're a transgender person, if you're a hetero person, whatever gender you identify with, you are welcome in my podcast and in the romance genre. And I think that just makes it really vital. But there are people who love the genre taking care of other people who love the genre. Like they, I think, People who write romance care a lot about their readers. Mm -hmm. Would you not agree, Sarah? Oh, absolutely. Like, and Mm -hmm. I feel like romance writers are one of the most 
like I said, inclusive, mm-hmm. understanding and um, lovely group, really just mm-hmm. everyone has been so wonderful in this community and just so accepting, you know, uh, for like the vast majority, I would say of everyone I, I've ever met. So. I, I agree. And I, um, have really tried hard as my podcast has evolved to seek out queer writers, uh, stories that feature trans people, you know, um, lesbian romances, you know, I've really tried to do that. And it's, and luckily it's not that hard anymore. I mean, there aren't as many as you would hope to find, but there Mm -hmm. are still plenty out there Mm -hmm. and it has been a really beautiful experience to, um, to encounter stories about people that you're not always meeting up with in everyday life, but just living life through their eyes for the, for the duration of a story. It's just really wonderful. So Poppy, in case ever listeners don't know where to find you, where is the best place? Well, I have enjoyed myself so thoroughly here and um listeners can find me at confessions of a closet um they can find me on twitter at poppy underscore confesses i hang out there a lot and i would love to talk to people thanks so much to poppy for joining the podcast in case you're curious i was also a guest on her podcast discussing the netflix version of persuasion and giving my own take as a filmmaker. So keep your ears peeled for that. I'll be sure to share on all of my socials when that episode drops. Poppy also hosts a Twitter space for female podcasters every other Thursday at 2 p.m. Central Standard Time. And the next one will be August 18th. So if you're interested in that, please come join. It's always a great time. As always, stay safe, Be well and keep writing. Bye.